So, simplify your infrastructure with TorqueBox. That's a lot of words. Um, what it means is TorqueBox makes it easy, whatever it is, um, for some values of it. So, you know who I am. I am the TorqueBox lead uh, and a JRuby contributor, and I work for Red Hat. I don't work in the Brno office here. I'm out of the USA, and I work remotely from home. So, has anybody here heard of TorqueBox, or are you here just for the stickers? <laughs> All right, great. So, TorqueBox is a Ruby application server. Um, if you're familiar with Java development all in the past, which maybe none of you are, because Java is kind of old school to the young crowd I see here, um, the idea of application server comes from the Java world. All it really means, though, that you need to know is it's web server plus extra stuff, plus some, some awesome extra stuff that we give you. And so to give you that application server, we are JRuby. So you cannot use Torbox without JRuby. Um, but why would you want to use anything but JRuby anyway? And there's a talk tomorrow morning, keynote by Charlie and Tom on JRuby. So don't miss that if you're interested in JRuby. Torbox is not just JRuby, though. Torbox is also JBoss Application Server 7, or as we call it, AS7. Um, again, if you have a Java background, you may have heard of JBoss Application Server before. This is not any application server you've known before unless you've dealt with AS7. It's vastly different, smaller, and more efficient. So if you have any preconceived notions about Java application servers, throw them out the window for the rest of this talk. Or come talk to me afterwards. We'll, we'll duke it out outside. So simplify your infrastructure, right? How, how can a server simplify your infrastructure? Well, your, your typical Ruby application, right, starts out maybe running on Passenger, running on Thin. Um, maybe you're hosting it on EC2 or on a box in a data center or on your local machine, or, or maybe you're on you know, a platform as a service. But either way, typically, you know, your Rails or your Sinatra or your Rack app starts out as a very simple application. And then if the best thing happens is that it gets popular, right? That's what we all hope. Um, if the application gets popular or users are demanding more features, maybe it's not popular, but users are still demanding a lot more features, that, that one user you have, um, you have to add more to it, right? And eventually, you hit a limit where there's only so much you can do in the web request response cycle of an application. So at some point, you end up adding asynchronous tasks using rescue or delayed job or any other Ruby framework. If you're a Python person in this talk, I'm, I'm not sure the Python equivalent of these in Ruby. Um, so, you know, asynchronous tasks. This is like if you're uploading an image. Like the previous talk, he needs to generate thumbnails for ASCII casts. Um, that would be done asynchronously. You don't want the user to have to wait for that. And then eventually you need some kind of a cron script or a recurring job. You either clean out some temporary files or um, who knows. Every application is different. You know, you suck in a data file once a night from some credit card processing application and or, or you know, you, you read that credit card numbers through email because you get an email every night of credit card numbers that's very secure. Um, and you use that to buy a lot of stuff on eBay or uh, Amazon. So whatever the application does, a lot of times you end up having these recurring jobs. And then it's not just recurring jobs. You also run into long-running demons. Um, these are things... Uh, the example we always come up with is a Twitter client where you Twitter streaming API. If you want to connect to Twitter streaming API from a Ruby application, you don't just connect inside of a web request response cycle, right? They, they want you to connect to the streaming API, stay connected, and not just connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect, connect, disconnect. Um, there's other examples. It, maybe you're, you've got a custom socket server, or maybe you've got uh, who knows what else running. Um, and so you need a long-running daemon. And when you have that long-running daemon, you have to have a way to start and stop it. And when it dies, if it dies, if you're on MRI, it, it may die at some point. If you're on JRB, it'll never die, right? Um, with a lot of JRB fans in the crowd. Uh, and so you have to have something to monitor, God or Monit, or whatever the, the latest monitoring solution is. And there's more than just this. This is just kind of a simple example. But you get into caching, you get into load balancers. I mean, infrastructure gets complicated the bigger your application gets. 
especially when there's more than one server involved. So Torquebox tries to reduce that complexity. The diagram here, uh, everything in red are things provided by the underlying JBoss application server. Everything in orange are our Ruby APIs. So we provide Ruby APIs to things provided by the underlying application server. What that means is we provide asynchronous tasks and messaging. We, we provide scheduled jobs like cron. We provide long-running daemons. We provide more than what's shown here even. We provide caching. A lot of services built into Torquebox uh, without any extra setup or monitoring required to, to you know, set up your cron tab or uh, start your rescue or your uh, delayed job workers, that kind of stuff. So that's kind of the, the same thing I just said, uh, but instead of the graphical, a little more text form. It is important to, to note that we do support Rails, Sinatra, and any other Rack-compliant web application. So some people use Torquebox just for the web features, and so we support any Ruby web application um, as long as you're using Rack standard. And we do, you, you can use some streaming APIs with Torquebox too, but there are a few frameworks out there that are not Rack-compliant that you probably may or not be able to use on Torquebox. Messaging, I mentioned earlier, scheduled jobs, daemons, I mentioned all this earlier. Caching, I kind of glanced on. We have a distributed cache out of the box, so you cluster the next bullet clustering. If you cluster Torquebox servers, you get uh, cache capacity increase as you add more servers to your cluster. So if you're used to having to run a farm of memcache processes, uh, you don't have to do that if you don't want to anymore. You can just add more nodes to your Torquebox cluster. And not only do you get additional web and messaging capacity, but you get additional cache capacity. And Torbox is supported by Red Hat. So if, if it's mission critical, um, you can call Red Hat. And there's a, I'm sure there's a salesperson that would love to talk to you. Um, uh, and Torbox, we try to make it easy to install. There's various ways to install it depending on what your background is. For Rubyists, the easiest way is the Torquebox server gem. If you're not using RVM, um, or you're on Windows, or you prefer not to install it via a gem, but as a zip download, we have a website, uh, torquebox.org slash getting started, slash the version number you want to use. And it'll walk you through the different ways to install based on your environment. So if you're on Windows, Torquebox works on Windows. I don't know, g given reactions from previous talks, I'm not sure there's many Windows people here at all. But there are quite a few Ruby developers that are forced to develop on Windows or developers on Windows that would like to use Ruby. And so JRuby helps a lot with that, and Torquebox supports Windows as well. Um, so it's fairly easy installation. It is a large gem. This, we're not talking one meg, this is a 100 meg gym. So if, don't do this on your cell phone. Especially if you're from outside the country and you have a very limited data plan like I have. Uh, after you install Torquebox, you can optionally apply, for Rails applications only, you can optionally apply a Rails template. And what this will do is change your Rails application session storage to use Torquebox session storage. That gives you clustered session replication. So instead of having to use the database or memcache, you can use our session replication. And then if a, uh, you pull a server out of load, the session is replicated to all the other servers. So if you pull a server out from behind your load balancer, or if it crashes, the user will never know. You know. They hit the load balancer, they get redirected to a new server, and the session is still there. So this is very similar if you use active record or memcache sessions, but it doesn't require the external setup. The uh, Rails cache is also set up to use Torquebox cache if you do this. And there's various different modes for the Torquebox cache. Um, our documentation talks more about how to choose which mode. And this also adds Torquebox to your gem file if this is a Rails 3 application using Bundler, which most seem to be. But this step is completely optional, not needed if you're not a Rails app. And you don't have to do it if you are a Rails app. But it makes some things simpler. So after that, you deploy your application to Torquebox. The deploy step is unique to Torquebox and maybe some other JRB web servers. Um, a similar passenger has a similar idea as well. You can run more than one application in Torquebox. So it's, you, can't, you don't just run Torquebox from within the application root. Um, you can, but the, the real power and how a lot of people use it is they deploy multiple applications to Torquebox. And these don't have to be just Ruby applications. These can be Java applications, which again is not the audience here 
but I wouldn't be surprised if some of you at least work somewhere that has Java applications in production and you're trying to get them to move to Ruby. And it's a lot easier to do that when you can deploy both applications to one server. Um, so Torquebox deploy your application and then Torquebox run to boot up the server and that will run all of the deployed applications. So we, we kind of showed the pictures earlier of the typical Ruby application, right? Let's, let's walk through a little bit how some of the Torquebox features, how you would port a typical Ruby application, maybe MRI or maybe JRuby, to Torquebox. Uh, background jobs is, is the most common thing people like to have out of Torquebox. The, like the first thing people say, yes, this is cool, let me use Torquebox for this. And so if you're using delayed job, uh, we have a class that takes forever. Um, you know, the method does anything, but it takes forever, right? And so with delayed job, you instantiate that class, and there's a delay method delayed job provides. Or if you're using an older delayed job version, there's a delayed job dot and queue method. And so you call foo dot delay dot take forever, right? And that's the code is very simple with delayed job for this, but you still have to run those workers. All this is going to do, you've got to set up a database table, either Mongo or um, relational database table. And you've got to run workers with a rate task or some other way to actually run these jobs. Um, so it's a little extra step that you've got to, you've got to figure out in your infrastructure set up. And then um, you know, you've got to figure out how do I scale that separately from scaling my web tier. But with Torquebox, this is the identical class. We have to include one line, Torquebox messaging backgroundable. And, and with the delay job, you may have to include it. I'm not sure how it got itself into the magic namespace here, delay. Um, so you include Torquebox messaging backgroundable, and now you call foo.background.take forever. And that's, that's so almost identical to the delayed job, right? We called foo.delay, well now we call foo.background. And maybe we should even alias .background to .delay so that people porting from delayed job will have less code to change or no code to change. But the big advantage here is you don't have to set up those external worker processes. You don't have to do anything external. You deploy this application to Torquebox, you call that method, and now it runs in the background. We use, it runs on top of our messaging internally, but you don't have to know that. You just know I, I call the method, it runs in the background, and I get a future object back that can query for status and results. So that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, it's, it's you know, simplify your infrastructure, right? We just got rid of that whole slice of where you had to set up your delayed job separately. Scheduled jobs, we, we do a similar way. Cron only runs once a minute. Uh, at least on most systems. Uh, Windows doesn't have cron. It has a different system schedule, task schedule maybe. Um, and if you have a cron job, you've got to either call a Rails runner or a rake task. You know, it's got to boot your Rails environment or your Sinatra environment or whatever application environment and then run the, the code. And there's a whole, you know, Ruby Toolbox website. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that website. There's a whole category for scheduling where it's people trying to solve the problem of cron with Ruby long-running demons mainly like Rufus schedule or whenever Jim, that kind of stuff. Uh, but with Torquebox, we give you that out of the box. Torquebox schedule job, it's a simple job class, a simple run method. The run method gets called every, we'll see in a minute how you specify how often, but every time the job runs, we call the run method. Uh, this has all of your Rails or Snatcher, all of your application environment available to it. You can call into any other, you know, this could be a model here. Um, so it's a very simple class, and there's a configuration file, uh, torquebox.rb, that lives in your application root where you can set these things up. And you tell it, I have a job, the, the class of the job, and then your cron expression. And this is a, um, Quartz is a Java library. It's cron expression. There's one extra field. The first field is seconds, not minutes. So you can do up to once per second granularity with torquebox cron jobs. But no external processing, no synchronization of your cron tab scripts every time you deploy your new application. Um, when you start your application, we start your jobs. When you undeploy your application, we stop your jobs. Long-running daemons, very similar to, to jobs. Um, here's an example of a long-running daemon. It, it needs an initialized method, a start and a stop. That's all it has to have. And... Uh, we start this when your application starts, and we stop it when your application stops. So in this case, we spawn a new thread in the start. The start has to return quickly. Um, I've given several talks in the last few days, and every time I bring this up, I realize, you know, we should really do that for you. So soon, Torquebox will spawn the new thread for you, and you can just run your code. Uh, 
and, and then you do whatever you need to do. In this case, we sleep forever, right? And we wait until a, a prince comes by and kisses us to, to wake us up. Uh, so this would just run. You deploy the application. This would just print ZZZ on the command line every second um, until you undeploy the application. Then it would stop. Not very useful, but it's hard to fit a useful example on that slide. Just like our job, we configure this with toolbox.rb. Uh, in this case, instead of a job, we call it a service, and you give it the name of the service class. And then you can pass, there's a lot of options for both jobs and services, and everything here has options I'm not showing you, that you can pass in config variables and other stuff to these things. So that's torquebox, services, jobs. Um, caching earlier, like I said, we gave it to you for free if you use the Rails template. We changed it to torquebox cache, but you can manually instantiate the cache and put and get keys if you'd like. If you're at all interested in Torquebox so far, uh, there is a great book on Torquebox, Pragmatic Programmer's book, Deploying JRuby. Deploying with JRuby, actually. It looks like I typed the title in my uh, talk here, but the URL has the right title. And there's a discount code if you're interested. Um, Joe Cutner, the author, uh, the book covers Torquebox, but it doesn't cover just Torquebox. It covers other alternative deployment strategies with JRuby. So if you're interested in Torquebox, uh, maybe check out the book. Check out the description and just see, see if it's something you're interested in. It goes over the pros and cons of Torquebox and other solutions. But instead of from hearing it from me, which I'm, I'm very biased, obviously I'm the Torquebox lead, this is a third party that will kind of walk you through the different solutions to help you figure out if Torquebox is right for you or if JRuby is right for you. And if so, how do you go about putting it into production? I can't really get into that here in, in 30 minutes. Um, but it's a, it's a great book. And, and the discount should be a decent amount. I don't actually know how much. So, uh, But let me know. I'll go buy it in a minute and find out. Uh, so the other things I've got... Um, Torquebox.org is our website. GitHub.com slash Torquebox. I didn't mention this earlier. We are completely open source. Well, you may have assumed because I work from Red Hat, but Torquebox is open source. Not only are we open source, the entire team, there's five of us on the team that you would consider the Torquebox team. And we are all work from home full time, geographically distributed, which means that all of our communication happens in our IRC channel on there or on our mailing lists which are, can be linked, linked from the website. So if you're interested in Torquebox, hang out in IRC, hop on the mailing lists, um, mention us, talk to us on Twitter, and you can, be, you can not just ask questions but you can be involved in all the decisions that take place as far as Torquebox in the future and changes. And you can also help out new people that you know, are trying out Torquebox. So IRC is the great way, and distributed teams means that you're involved with everything if you come hang out in the IRC. Uh, some of you probably saw this earlier. I have Torquebox stickers down front, here and there, under the arrows, and at the Red Hat table. Um, and I also have some Immutant stickers with me. I haven't set them out yet. I wanted to explain it first. Uh, everything I just showed you about Torquebox is Ruby on JBoss Application Server. Immutant is closure on JBoss application server. And this is not a closure conference, so there's not an immutant talk. But um, if you're interested in closure, come talk to me, and I can point you to the right people there. And uh, it's, it's basically the exact same thing as Torquebox, but for closure. And they're, you know, they, they were talking at closure cons this weekend. So I've got a, uh, about five minutes left. Time for questions. You know, who's, who's got a Torquebox question? Uh, yes. Uh, so when you uh, mentioned all the things that Torquebox does for you, uh, I, mentioned, I noticed that you didn't mention anything about web sockets, and that's something that we usually run as an outside process of the okay. website. That's a great question. Um, the question was, I, I didn't mention anything about web sockets when I was mentioning Torquebox features. Torquebox does have some web socket support. I didn't mention it because it's a, it's a short time, for, you know, I didn't want to get into it too much. We support... We have several demo applications that support WebSockets, but we don't give you access to the native WebSocket um, connection. We feel that it's a little hard to know what to do with that as a developer. And, and we probably should, will give you access in the future if you really know what you're doing. But we expose them via something we call Stomplets, which is a stomp protocol over WebSockets. It may sound a little strange, but it's very powerful in that 
It allows us to hook our, our internal message bus, which is a Java JMS message bus. All you have to know is it's our messaging. You can hook that up directly to a browser. So you can publish messages to a browser, server-side. And you can correlate HTTP sessions to the WebSocket connection so you know this user in my browser. You know, like you know how to reference an HTTP session to send a message into the user and receive messages from the user. The book I mentioned actually goes into that a decent amount. Um, and we have resources on our website. We've got previous presentations I can point you to, or we can just talk more about WebSockets. And uh, does Immutant also have something like that? Or? That's a great question. The question was, does Immutant support WebSockets? I, they will. I'm not sure if they have it right now. They might. They just had another release since I've been in Europe. So I haven't, I'm based in the U.S., and so I have time zone difference. I haven't been keeping up as much. But they did a new release a few days ago. And so if it's not in there, I would expect it in an upcoming release. There was another question. Uh, at the beginning, you showed the server command. Uh, does it do code reloading so it's uh, usable for development? Yes, that's, that's a great question. I don't know why I didn't mention it. Um, Torbox is usable for development. It is. So uh, let me. the question was, can you use Torbox in development? And I'll go back to the command. So this Torbox deploy your application and Torbox run, right? That starts the server. Once that's going, you can change any of your typical Rails view files or your Sinatra view files or, or really pretty much anything, your models, and it all gets reloaded. The background, the scheduled jobs, you can change the scheduled job class, and the next time it fires, it'll run the new code, all in development. And, you know, from production, we turn that off. Um, and the messaging, too, you can change. I didn't show it here, but we have message processors, which are like a message-driven, it's, it's a way to run Ruby code every time a message comes in on a queue or topic. And so you can change that code, and the next time a message comes in, we'll pick up the new code and run it. So yes, it's just development like you're used to. You just have to run the server. The only extra step really is the torquebox deploy command to run the server first. But otherwise, it's development like you're used to. And a lot of people do develop in torquebox, and I recommend it. Yes, one more question. Um. Does the scheduler have a feature like proof of schedulers uh, blocking so that uh, if I have one version of a job still running when the next version should start, say every two hours, it takes two hours and ten minutes, does it start after the first one is uh, already uh, stopped or does it start immediately and I have two uh, jobs running at the same time? That's a good question. So the question was, is it possible to have more than one of one, more than one copy of the same job running at once if the job takes longer than the interval between the jobs firing. Uh, it is, yes. There is a concurrency setting to control that. So you can set the job concurrency to one, and only one, the job will only ever run one at a time. <coughs> excuse me. One at a time. And when the job stops, the next job will then run. Um, the default concurrency in production is higher than one, I believe. I have to check a docs to be sure. And if higher, one, higher than one, it means they'll be running at the same time. Um, and so that's a, what I personally like to do, and it depends on your application, but if I have a very long running job, I like to kick off the job in the scheduled job and then hand it over to messaging or the background method to actually run the processing separately so that I am not tying up my scheduling job threads with my long running job. I just use it to kick off my jobs. And that gives you other benefits when you get in a cluster. Because if you do that in a cluster now, different nodes of the cluster can pick up that work and you can load balance the work of the job across the cluster, um, which you, you don't get by default if you just run the job directly from the scheduled job. You, if you send a message, then other nodes in the cluster pick up that message and will run it. It's a great way to load balance. And uh, I didn't mention much about clustering, but in a cluster, you can say only run this job on one node in the cluster or every node in the cluster. And the same for the demons, long-running demons. Anything else? All right, great. Don't forget stickers. I'll put immune stickers out. Appreciate it.